morning, Fellowship Church. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing about the worthiness of our Jesus this morning. We sing, oh, the sweetness of your grace. Oh, the sweetness of your grace. To feel you move and see you sing. We give you all the glory, Lord. But you are worthy still of all. All the earth. Sing your praise and every language Jesus lift it high, lift it high around your throne until you come one evening, until you come, until you come, Lord. We
confess our need and dependence on God this morning. We sing, Lord, I need you. Bye. 
Lord, I pray for the needs that are represented in this room this morning. We bring our voices and we bring our hearts and we bring our focus to set it on you, but we also know that we bring a lot of stuff with us this morning. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters, uh, whether it be physical or emotional or spiritual, relational, that have needs this morning, Lord, real and legitimate, uh, important needs. I pray with them this morning as they bring them to you in this song. As we declare, oh Lord, we need you every hour. (laughs) We need you every week. We need you. I also pray this morning for my friends who are here who are exploring faith. That this would be a morning that their eyes would be open and that they would understand their very large and desperate need for the saving work of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of this moment, for the privilege of gathering together in the name of Jesus. One more time, one more Sunday, one more service, and encouraging one another and worshiping you. You are worthy to be worshiped, O Lord. And we do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Be seated if you would. Just for a moment, I want to greet those of you who are online with us. Uh, We we want to say thanks for being with us, worshiping with us virtually or digitally. Some of you are ill, so you're online with us instead of in person today. May the Lord return your health and restore you to good health. And some of you may be online with us because you're thinking about joining us. We hope that you will. We hope that you'll come and worship with us. You will be welcomed. You will be loved here. uh, And we would love to have you come in person. And for those of you who decided to do that and you're here in person as a guest, welcome. Welcome. We're so glad that you made the decision to go. We always tell people that we know it takes a lot of courage to go to a new place. And we want you to realize that all of us here at one point, we came here for the first time. We were all guests at one point. And so we, we do remember that it takes a lot of courage to park in a new parking spot and walk through a new door and sit in a new seat. And so we see that, we acknowledge that, we thank you for that. If you're looking for a new church home, welcome home. Yeah, let's tell them welcome home. Praise God. Welcome home. Uh, You do need to understand, and it's so important that I want to say it outright. We're not a perfect church. Uh, we, We are unperfect, but we worship a perfect God. And this is a great place for you to grow in your faith. And so if you're interested in taking steps and knowing uh, the God of the Bible, the one true living God, this is a great place for you. And uh, we're so happy uh, that you are here. Church family, uh, this morning is Communion Sunday. And this morning is going to be a little bit different. You probably think we always change it for you every single month, right? And we're not trying to do that. But we are... Uh, especially blessed, excited, uh, and praising the Lord because this morning one of our elder candidates, his name is Kent Pigeon, uh, he is going to come and lead us uh, in our communion time. Uh, he's not an elder yet. Uh, we are still in the discernment process. But w- one part of that is allowing him to minister to folks, and we thought it would be a great way to do that if he led communion. So in just a few moments, he's going to come. But before he does that, I just want to remind all of us, myself included, that communion is a significant thing. And it's not something that we're supposed to do lightly. And I know that sometimes Sunday mornings can be kind of uh, done through rote memory, right? We're in a hurry. We jump in the car. We drive to the church. We put our smile on. We sing loud. And it's like we just do stuff out of memory. I don't want that to be what we do this morning with communion. The Bible says that we really need to approach communion uh, thoughtfully and prayerfully. And so before Kent comes, I just want to give us a space to just spend some time with Almighty God. Maybe we need to say, Lord, would you search my heart this morning? Or maybe we need to say, Lord, I just need to refocus my gaze on you. Or maybe we just need to pray through, through some things. But I want to give you that space to do that before Kent comes and leads us in communion. So I want to invite you just to bow where you're sitting right now and just spend some time preparing your heart and preparing your mind, just getting ready 
to come forward in this time of communion, celebrating the goodness of God. Let's spend some time praying, and then Kent will come. Good morning, church. So as Pastor Zach mentioned, I'm in the process, walking through this process of uh, potentially becoming an elder here at the fellowship. And one of the steps in that process that we're taking is I've recently written my testimony. So you'll have the opportunity very shortly to read that written testimony. And when you do, I hope one thing is extremely clear. I hope that you see that I am abundantly thankful for what God has done in my life. And most of all, that I am thankful for the work that Jesus did on the cross. I am so thankful for the atoning sacrifice of our Lord Jesus and the forgiveness that he offers through that. And that's what we're here for. We've gathered together for communion today. And communion is our opportunity to remember and to be thankful. We're going to remember what Jesus did on the cross for us, how through his death, and his sacrifice, we are made right with God. We are able to come to him and receive forgiveness. So we celebrate that today. Now in just a moment, we'll share together in the Lord's Supper. And the way we'll do that is this. Uh, we have four stations set up in the worship center. So if you are in these middle sections here, please come forward using the outside aisles. You can receive your elements and return down the center aisle to your seats. If you're on the outside, you can take the outside aisles to the back stations and receive the elements there and come back to your seats. And what we'll do is we'll hold on to those elements, come back to your seat, and we'll take them all together. Now, if you have had God's call on your life and you have turned from your sin, you've repented and you have received the grace and forgiveness that God offers through Jesus Christ, you are welcome at this table. Come and remember. If you're new to faith and you're just starting to think about these things and reflect on these things, I encourage you to take this time to pray and to reflect on how the death of Jesus makes us right with God, how Christ's sacrifice is the atonement we need to be made right. Before we come together to take communion, let's, uh, let's turn to prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful. We are thankful for how you made a way. We are thankful for your sacrifice. Lord Jesus, you gave yourself up so that we could be made new. I ask that you continue to transform us into those new creations. Let us live lives in obedience to you. God, we give you all the praise and thanks this morning. 
pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All is prepared. Come when you're ready. Now hear the words of the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite you to stand up. We're going to continue in worship. And this next song is such a perfect way to respond to remembering the work of Jesus Christ. 
As we think about when we were in the darkness and Christ came and moved us to the light. Let's give praise together.
worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Sing Jesus Jesus the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever see, worthy, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, we live for you, sing holy, we sing holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. above every other Jesus the only one who could ever is worthy singing worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you upon his love is a firm foundation. Listen to the scripture this morning. Would you close your eyes? Envision the scene. You might have heard the story coming from Isaiah. But we're about to sing the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. 
And so I want you to see the scene that he is seeing. I want you to feel the words that we're about to sing. He says this in chapter 6, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Picture this scene of the Lord. The whole temple is filled with the train of his robe. There's smoke around. And there are voices exclaiming how set apart how holy our God is. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God, we realize and recognize that right now we are in your presence. We realize that when we walked in this room this morning that we who believe in you, Father, have your Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And so we take just a moment to pause to reflect on how you are ever-present with us right now. And so in your presence, Lord, we choose and declare together the words that the angels are singing around your throne room, that you are holy, that there is no one like you. You are our God, and we are your people. And so we submit and surrender to you, and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together.
his name. So, Father, we praise your name. We know we're not even worthy of being able to even say your name. Yet you have given us freedom and forgiveness that is found in your Son. We are grateful for remembering the sacrifice that he has done on the cross for us. For your scripture rings true that while we were still sinners, while we were the worst, Christ died for us. And so, Father, we thank you that we don't have to clean ourselves up in your presence. You are the one that does that. We thank you how Jesus transforms and changes our lives. Continue to do that in my life, Father. Make me into the person you want me to be. I pray that for the rest of my family today here. Lord, that you would do a work in all of our lives so that when the world sees us, they see Jesus ringing through. There's something different about us, and that difference is you. And so we give you all the glory, all the honor, Lord. If we've robbed you of any of it today, Father, forgive us for that. Help us to direct our minds, our hearts, and our praise towards you. Father, we pray over Pastor Zach as he comes to give the message this morning. Father, would you give him the words that we need to hear? Would you empower him 
by your Holy Spirit. We're so thankful for who you are. We praise you and we pray all of these things in the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. We all collectively pray in his name this morning. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Amen. As you get comfortable and find your seat, uh, I want to remind you of this rite of passage that we have in kind of modern society. I don't know how far it goes back, but I can tell you that I've continued the tradition. It is that moment when you're raising kids and you sit them down and you say, now look, with great privilege comes great responsibility. Who has, who has had that conversation? Either you've given it or received it, right? You remember that? I remember when I was getting ready to get my driver's license and I was so excited about it. My mom and dad sat me down and said, now, Zach, I just want you to know with great privilege comes great responsibility. And I was like, what? And they said, yeah, you know, let's talk about this. And they were talking me through the fact that new things were coming. I was getting my driver's license, and that meant every now and then I could borrow the car keys, and I would have the opportunity to drive around, and with great privilege comes great responsibility. And I had that conversation with my parents probably 4,000 times. Now, young people, if you haven't had it yet, just wait. That's coming. It's going to come either when you go to get a cell phone or whether you go to get your driver's license or whatever it may be. With great privilege comes great responsibility. Uh, today's message is like a cousin to that. It's not that message, but they're related. Uh, and I think it's an important conversation for us to have because this is November. And this is the season where we're being thankful, right? And uh, maybe at some point in your Bible study time or maybe during your prayer time, you're going to sit down and you're going to make a list of all the things that you're thankful for, all the gifts, all the th ways that God has been gracious to you. And here's what I want you to think about this morning. It is great to receive gifts from God, but what's really important is what you do with those gifts. God may gift you this, whatever this may be, right? But what's important is not just that God has given that to you, but but what am I doing with the gift that God has given me? This morning, we're going to look in Genesis chapter 11. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 11. And we are going to be studying a group of people who did not do this well. There's no better way to say it. There's no kinder way to say it other than they failed miserably. And I think it's important for us to look at those failures in the Bible. I had a lead pastor one time. And he probably said once a month. And you're probably saying, Pastor Zach, I think you say this once a month. Maybe so, because it's worth repeating over and over and over. But wise people learn from other people's mistakes. And this morning, uh, as we think about utilizing the gifts that God has given us for righteous purposes and holy purposes and good purposes, uh, we're going to explore that this morning. We're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 11 at a group of people, not one person, a whole group, who did not use the gifts that God gave them very well. We're going to be looking in Genesis chapter 11, starting in verse 1. We're going to be looking at nine verses. Look with me this morning at God's word. Uh, and then we'll look to our notes section as well. It says, now the whole earth had one language and all the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain uh, in the land of Shinar and they settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And then they said, come let us build ourselves a city and let's build a tower with its tops in the heavens and let's make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they will propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come now, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. 
So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all of the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of questions that pop out from this scripture, and there's a lot to be said about what we're looking at this morning. And and I say that because if you have a question in your mind as we look at this text today that I don't get to this morning, I want you to notice at the bottom of the sheet, there's a way for you to just reach out and ask a question. And so if I leave, if, if, if your question is not on my list to answer this morning, ask it to me anyway. Uh, scan that QR code and let's talk about whatever it is that you find intriguing about this scripture. Uh, one of the things that probably collectively all of us find intriguing or maybe not find intriguing, but maybe even some of us struggle with uh, the, the sense of, wow, is this really that big of a deal? Is God really upset that somewhere, someplace a long time ago, a group of people got together and they were just building a building? Like, what's the big deal with that, right? And so I want to spend some time helping you to understand what's the big deal. Now, we didn't look at this scripture, but if you're making notes because you want to go back and study this later, a really important verse for you to understand is found in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. That is when God says to these people, what I want you to do is I want you to disperse over all the world And I want you to multiply. I want you to populate the entire planet. That was God's command. That was God's wish. That was God's desire. That was God's calling. And now we get two chapters later and we see they had decided not to. Now, as I was thinking about the scripture, I was thinking about modern ears and modern eyes looking at the scripture and and how likely it is that some of us might read what these people did and say, this is really small potatoes. Like This really isn't that big of a deal. It's one of those things where we should call it a little mistake and just move on. It's not that big of a deal. Or we may, we may call it a, a whoopsie <laughs> and shrug it off and act like it didn't happen and move on. But that would be modern ears and modern eyes. And what I want to do this morning is help you understand why Genesis 11, 1 through 9, not not only was a big deal for them, but is a huge deal for us. And I want you to see the consequences. If you have your notes, you see that uh, we're going to look at the consequences of what happened first. And then we're going to seek to learn from their failure. Now, I just want to be clear. I'm not beating these people up. I'm not throwing rocks at these people. I'm just saying they messed up and let's you and I learn from it before we do the same thing, right? But this morning, let's start by understanding the consequences. I see in the scripture three significant signs or evidences that this rebellion was significant. The first is in verse 7 where it says God came down to oppose them. God came down to oppose them. Now, we know that God leaving heaven and coming to earth isn't something that never happens. It happens often in the Bible, even in the New Testament, uh, back into the Old Testament. We see it happen over and over again. We know that God visits earth. We know that God made his dwelling on earth. We know that God visited his people. We know that we saw that in in the Garden of Eden. We know that God came and would spend time and, and comfort people. We know that God would come and spend time and guide people. We know that God would come and and do all kinds of things here on earth. But most of the time, they are so awe-inspiring, it just makes us want to go, that's so nice. But not here. One of the consequences of their rebellion is that God came down to oppose them. And I think that's significant. Verses 7 and 8 give us that picture that God is going to come down and confuse them and oppose them and disperse them. And so that's their relationship to God. I would call that a vertical consequence between them and God. The horizontal consequence, the consequence between them and themselves is the second point, And that is that community was broken and fragmented. 
God did two substantial and significant things that day. Uh, He dispersed them and he confused their language. And so in essence, because of their rebellion, they, they were forced to disperse and they were forced to have different languages, which leads me to this third point of consequence, and that is that their obedience was done through discipline and not love. And this may be the one that makes me the saddest in my heart. Let me explain what I mean. I have three kids. Uh, my wife, Crystal, and I, we've worked really, 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 really hard at raising them. Uh, to, to flourish and to be in the household and walk with God. And there are times in our household, I've got a 21-year-old this month, I've got a 19-year-old, I've got a 13-year-old, and there are times in our house where Crystal and I, we need something done. So we may suggest it, we may assign it, we may hint at it, we may outright say it, right? But, but one of our kids comes into the knowledge that we have a need and we're looking to them to fulfill it. And I want to believe that all three of my amazing children are just sitting around waiting to find some way that they can just bless the family. And when they hear of this need, they say, you know, Dad, this morning I was just looking for ways that I could do what you want me to do and if you think that the trash is important and if you think its location is important specifically dad if you think the location of the trash should be out in the bin instead of here in the house out of pure love I would just be pleased to take this trash and deliver it to the bin now clearly in our house that's the way it happens every time But sometimes kids are busy, right? They have stuff to do. (laughs) Sometimes they have other things that they want to do. And there have been one or two times in my kid's life where obedience didn't birth from a place of love. It was birthed from a place of discipline. And while that's good, and while discipline is a very good thing, I have to tell you that As it relates to this text, it chills me to think that that God would have to force me to obey him. That that obedience would be something that's done out of discipline and not love. Like, I don't ever want that to be said about me. I don't ever want it to be said about me that I rebelled against God and the discipline, right? Right? Is what caused me to obey. But that's one of the consequences that we see here. God had clearly given them the direction in chapter 9, verse 1. I want you to go and spread out all over this globe and populate this thing and multiply. And they were seeking to be rebellious. And so they obeyed through discipline, not through love. I think that's significant consequence. And so this morning, what I want for us to do, now that we see it's a big deal, right? We see a vertical Uh, consequence where God came down to oppose them. We see a horizontal consequence where their community, their togetherness was broken and disrupted. We see that their obedience was was shaped through, through discipline and not necessarily through love. Now, I want for us to learn some things from these people. The greatest thing you and I could do this morning would be to walk out this morning having learned what they did wrong so that we can go do it right is what we want to do this morning. So, so what do we learn from their failure? The first thing that we learn from their failure is that the gift of togetherness can be used in rebellion. Or if, if togetherness seems like a strange word for you, substitute the word community. The gift of community can be used towards rebellion. You see, the whole point this morning is for us to think about using the gifts that God has given us in the right way, in the good way, in the holy way. And one of the things that we learn from this group of people in Genesis chapter 11 is that they took the gift of togetherness, the gift of community, the gift of dwelling together for encouragement's sake, for survival's sake, for protection's sake, for comfort's sake. Just the the gift of being together was was perverted and it was used in rebellion. Here's what I want you to see. Go back with me into the scripture. 
And I want you to look at verse 3. And they said to one another. What's that mean? It means there wasn't one bad apple going around telling, hey, you know what we should do? We should rebel against God. There wasn't one black sheep. It was a collective thing. They began to talk to one another about rebellion. They used the gift of togetherness to entertain and then to adopt rebellion. Look in chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 4. And then they said to one another. They had the vision of rebellion and together they used that gift of togetherness for rebellion. I can't tell you how important this is. I cannot overemphasize the importance of this. Now we look at it and we usually don't build buildings. Probably we're not here making uh, bricks and building towers because we want to build a tower into heaven. And so you may look at this and go, I don't feel very connected to this. What does it look like in modern society? And so I did a little Q&A if you want to jot this down. The question is, what happens when the we or the us or the togetherness, what happens when we shift from being obedient to God to being in rebellion? And here's what happens. The society becomes more and more wicked because we are making decisions based on popular culture and what the group wants rather than the will of God. Now, if there's not application there, I can't help you. <laughs> you can look at the world today and see that the togetherness, the gift of togetherness oftentimes is used against the will of God. Now, you and I are at a disadvantage. I have to tell you this straightforwardly uh, as it relates to Genesis 11. And here's our disadvantage. You and I belong to a lot of different communities. These people in Genesis 11, they had one group. Like the PTA, they were all together. The community, all together. The community of faith, all together. Their friend circle, all together. Like, they were just one group of people in Genesis 11, right? But you and I operate in different circles of influence, and we have different communities that we belong to, and some of them relate to school, and some of them relate to hobbies, and some of them relate to church family, and some of them relate to jobs. And probably if you said, what groups do I belong to, you can make a long list. And so we have to be thoughtful with that. In fact, what I wrote down in my notes, because I thought that it was important for us to think about, is this is what I put in my notes as I was getting ready for this message. By the grace of God, we have the chance today to look deeply at our communities and get real with ourselves about the communities and about the tribes to which we belong. Meaning, I want to ask myself this question. The circles of friends... And the communities that I belong to, are we actively seeking to honor God or to rebel against God? And I've got to do that with every community that I belong to. And I've realized not every community that you belong to is a, quote, Christian community. We belong to other communities in the world that aren't necessarily stamped by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I realize that and, and I celebrate that actually. I think it's good that you and I who belong to Jesus are uh, out of the salt shaker and into the world and making a difference around us. But the question for you and I, am I using the gift of community to bless God or to fight God? The gift of togetherness can be used for rebellion. Second, the gift of technology can be used for rebellion. Now, you may look at this scripture. You may be looking back at it going, technology? I didn't see any technology in there. I didn't see any tech. There was no reference to tablets, computers, no iPhones, right? No Androids. There's no technology there. But here's what I want you to understand. At one time, bricks, they were a new technology, when? I don't know. I wasn't around. It was before my time. But, but think of technology in the terms of new things that we use to build our lives. And you can look at those bricks that they were making as some type of technology that was being leveraged for a purpose. And at some point, they decided to take their creative energies and to take these technologies that they were creating 
and to bring it together and to leverage their technology to rebel against God. And so that caused me to write down a question for myself. As I think about the different technologies that I have, now I have to be honest, when I walk by a house or a building and it's bricked, I don't think, oh, wow, that's some amazing technology right there. Like, I'm beyond that. I don't think in, in those terms anymore. But there's still new and innovative stuff that comes out, right, that we look at it and we go, well, now that's interesting. And all of those technologies that I see, experience, and embrace in my life, I just want to ask the question, am I using them? To love God or to fight God? For these people in Genesis 11, bricks were their technology. For me, my technology may be different. It may be the social media platforms. Or it may be computer programs that I use to either do good or to do evil, right? Or it may be technologies in some other places besides computers and phones. But the point is, the gift of technology of creating things because we're made in the image of God and we're creative beings can be used for good or evil. And I have to answer for myself, how am I using my technology? The third is ambition. The gift of ambition can be used to rebel against God. Now, in my mind at least, ambition is a rather neutral thing. It is the desire to get up and accomplish something. <laughs> now, the something, I think, is where it gets determined whether or not that ambition is good or misplaced. And what I want you to see here in the scripture this morning, go back with me in Genesis chapter 11, if you will. I want you to see that their ambition was not bent towards the things of God. Now, look with me uh, in, in verse 7. Uh, excuse me. Uh, not in verse 7. Look in verse 4. They said to one another, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, they're saying to one another, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They had so much ambition inside of them. Let's get up and build this magnificent, monstrous thing. Like you got to have some ambition to be able to see that and to have the energy to go and, and be about that. But it was so misplaced because it was done with the heart to build a name for myself so that I am not dispersed, meaning so that I'm not having to do what God wants for me to do. Ambition is God-given, but it's a gift that can be used in rebellion. Remember, the whole point of this message is for us to remember that the gifts that God has given to us, we're accountable for the way that we use those gifts. The gift of community, the gift of technology, uh, the gift of ambition. How we're using our gifts are important. What would it have looked like if they would have said, let's all come together and build something so magnificent that in 3,000 years, people will look at it and talk about how amazing God is. But that's not what they did. They said, let's build something so that people will remember us. And their primary motivation was me and not God. In other words, that song we just sang, holy, 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 they, they would be cool with that song as long as they could change a couple of words. They wouldn't change the holy, holy, holy part. But instead of Lord God Almighty, they would put their name. Holy, holy, holy is me, myself, and I. Look what I've done. I have built a tower to the heavens. Ambition and the purpose of it is important. And so my question is, what is your ambition driving you to do? And to whose glory is your ambition pointing? That's an important question for us. And while it's an important question, it may not be the most important question that we look at this morning. If you have your notes, you see that uh, there's one more question that I really think is important for us to really ask ourselves. And I want to give it to you this morning and explain why it's in your notes. The question is, have I learned that I can't work my way to heaven? Have I learned that I can't work my way to heaven? Here's why I say that to you. I want you to look at verse four. 
And I want you to hear what these people are saying to each other. Again, this is not just, you know, like one weirdo in the group that's throwing a wrench in everybody's obedience. This is what they're saying to one another in verse, in verse 4. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. They were trying to work their way into the heavens. And my question for you is, have you learned that you can't work your way to heaven? Now, in a sense, we can look at verse 4, right? And if, if we're honest, we can kind of look at it a little arrogantly and go, who are these people? Like, what are they thinking, right? They're going to build a tower that's going to get them to heaven? Bless their heart. And it's so easy for us so far removed to just kind of smirk at them and go, who are these people? But be careful because there's probably people in here this morning who think they're going to work their way to heaven. Now, they may not go out and make bricks and build a building so they can climb it and be in heaven but there are people who think that they're going to earn their way and they're going to work their way to heaven. And while on paper it may look as silly as it could possibly be, I can promise you in a room this large with this many people here, there are people sitting in this room right now and their full hope of being granted entrance into heaven one day when they die is that they have worked hard enough to get to heaven. And you may say, well, how do I know if that's where I'm at? You may, you may be new to faith. And you may be working through this and thinking through this right now for yourself, maybe for the first time. And you're like, well, I've never thought about this before. Answer this. Here, here's, how you, here's how you get to whether or not you're trying to work yourself into heaven. You just answer this simple question. If right now you were to stand before God and God were to say to you, why should I let you in to my heaven? How would you respond? Some might say, well, God, um, you know, at our church, once a month, we feed homeless people. And I go at least once a year. Or you may say, well, every time Pastor Zach says something about the budget, I put a little something in the box on the way out, right? Or you may say, well, I read my Bible or I did my prayers. Or you may say, well, Lord, I think that my good outweighed my bad. Don't you think? It, here's the thing with all of those responses. I'm being humorous, but this actually is really not humorous at all. It's eternally significant. What all of those responses have in common is that they're all based on me working my way to heaven. Maybe it's feeding the homeless. Maybe it's giving offerings. Maybe it's thinking, well, if my good outweighs my bad, I might get into heaven. It's not based on any of that. It's based on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We owed a debt that we could not pay. And he paid a debt that he didn't owe. And that's the beautiful significance of communion that we celebrate once a month that we've done this morning. It's that every time that we take communion, we preach to ourselves that I can't work my way into heaven. I can't earn my salvation. My only hope of eternal life is represented here with this bread and this juice, the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ and the shed blood of the Lord on the cross. And the Bible says that we're all sinners. And we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if you're here today and, and church is new for you and learning about faith is new for you, that is a fundamental scripture 
Some of us need to know that the Bible is very clear that we all are sinners. There's not a person that's in this room that's not a sinner. So we, we have all rebelled against God. The scripture says that our works do not get us into heaven. We are not saved by our works. Just like these people in Genesis 11 couldn't build that tower tall enough, our works can't build a tower tall enough to get us into heaven. We are not saved by works. The Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith. Our part of the equation is to simply come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. Just like we sang, I need you, Lord. I need you to save me. I need your sacrifice to give me life. I just wanted to be so clear about that this morning because, uh, because we live in a culture that's very religious. And I do not mean this negative towards our culture, but we live in a culture that's very religious but not very biblical. And it's important that when we think about the things of God, that we allow Scripture to shape the way that we think about them. So if you're here today thinking that one day when you stand before God and all of those angels are singing, holy, 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 like we were just singing, and the Lord says to you, how am I going to let you in? And, and you start to talk about all your good works, you've missed it. Your good works will never get you into heaven. And so if this is something that you're learning for the first time today, this is the morning that you need to turn from all of that and you need to put your trust in Jesus. You need to put your faith in Jesus. And I want to encourage you to do that today. Don't wait. Uh, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. And so if you're here and you're discovering all of this for the first time, or you're here and you've heard this hundreds of times, but you've never done it yet, then what I want to say to you today is don't wait any longer. Just like we look at these people trying to build their way into heaven, some of us are trying to work our way into heaven. And it's going to leave us exhausted, <laughs> getting nowhere in broken relationships. And actually, going back to the scripture, God will oppose that work. And so I want to ask you to bow with me this morning as we close. And as you just sit before God, I just want to pray over you this morning. Lord, first I pray for my friends who are here this morning who are trying to work their way into heaven. Or even if those who are online with us, worshiping with us this morning, might be trying to earn their way into heaven. I pray that the scripture would once again teach each one of us that that is not possible. I pray for my friends who need to take that step, who need to give up desiring to earn salvation. And I pray that you would give them not just that call, but that courage to take a step of faith and say, I need you, Lord. I need you. I pray for people this morning to put their faith in you, Jesus. I pray over my brothers and sisters who have taken that step, that as they reflect on Genesis chapter 11, that they would think about their communities and they would think about the technologies that they have in their life and they would think about all of that ambition that is surging through their veins and their minds that wake them up on a Monday morning and cause them to go out into the world and do great things. I pray that as we reflect, we would see that these three gifts are being used for your glory. And so, oh Lord, we go from this place with a full heart, thanking you that you've allowed us to learn a lot of important things from some way distant people that just the first pass we may not think that we have much in common with. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Word of God. Thank you for its power, its accuracy, its relevancy to our life. We pray all of this together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to close our time this morning. Uh, I do want to say to you that if this is the morning 
that you need to take that step of faith and say, I'm no longer going to try to earn my salvation, but I want to put my faith in Jesus. Let's you and I talk right now, right after the service, uh, because I want to celebrate with you uh, a new life in Christ. And I want to help you. I want to give you some resources that will be helpful for you. And again, if you're a guest, we'd love to meet you over at the Welcome Center. We'd love to learn your name. Uh, share a gift with you and encourage you to come to one of our newcomers' lunches. So if you're a guest, would you make your way over there? But whether you're a guest or a long timer, would you stand to your feet? And would you place your hands out to receive this closing blessing as we go today? The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Oh, Lord, we go now with peace because you go with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. You are loved. Have a great week and God bless you.